Did you know about the world's shortest war ever? In a unique chapter of history, people witnessed a conflict in their lives that not only lasted a mere 38 minutes, but also became the shortest war ever recorded in history. This event, known as the Anglo-Zanzibar War, fought on the continent of Africa, has been acknowledged by the Guinness Book of World Records as the shortest war in the world. However, the question remains, between which two countries did this historic battle occur, and how was the outcome decided in just under half an hour? This has been a topic of discussion in this video. Welcome to a remarkable story of a historical conflict that occurred on an island in the Indian Ocean, known as Zanzibar. This island nation, situated nearly 45 kilometers off the coast of East Africa, was once under the dominion of the Zanzibar Sultanate, controlled by Oman. Everything was running smoothly until the emergence of a power struggle that aimed to dominate the politics of Zanzibar and the broader East African region. This was a period when the British Empire, which had long had its sights set on the island of Zanzibar as part of its East African interests, began to exert its influence. By leveraging its strategic position, the entity managed to bring numerous resources under its control, thus making the British perceive themselves as significantly more advanced in comparison to Eastern nations, including India, Africa, and several Arab countries. This was because the island of Zanzibar and the control over Oman were aspects the British Empire could not easily seize. In 1856, upon their leader's demise, a division for the throne of Oman occurred among his sons, marking the point when Oman was split into two, with Oman being managed by one son and the smaller territories by the other. Majid bin Said established a new nation, Zanzibar, from Oman, marking a significant shift for a region that had been under Oman's influence for centuries. Under his leadership, Zanzibar was recognized as an independent country, breaking away from the shadow of the British Empire, which had previously seen Majid bin Said as a key ally. This move allowed Zanzibar to carve out its own identity, with Majid bin Said placing his stamp on the nation's future. As a result, Zanzibar began to emerge on the political scene, previously influenced by the British Empire's interests. The island's economy was heavily reliant on what was the last slave market in the world, a grim trade that involved the transportation of slaves from Africa's mainland to Zanzibar. In the era of the slave trade, ships frequently witnessed slaves jumping into the Indian Ocean, clasping their chains, either due to illness or in a desperate attempt to escape a journey that barely stretched 40 kilometers. Those who perished were heartlessly cast into the sea, their bodies disposed of without any semblance of dignity. In Zanzibar, a bustling market thrived. Trading in these human here, hundreds of slaves were crammed into tiny cells, shackled together without the basic decency of clothing, treated no better than animals. The auctioning process was brutal. They were lined up, closely inspected, and then sold to the highest bidder, a transaction marked by sheer inhumanity and devoid of any compassion. In a complex and intense society, where tolerance was minimal and cries or shouts were seldom heard, the dynamic significantly shifted over the years, leading to substantial changes, including in Zanzibar's economy. The primary source of income transitioned from the slave trade, significantly supported by the British, to other avenues. For the Sultan of Zanzibar, an extraordinary palace was constructed right on the seafront, in Pemba Island. This palace offered every conceivable amenity, beyond what one could even imagine. Notably, this palace was the first building in East Africa to be equipped with electricity. In the past, the city of Majuta, Ismahel, was known for its extensive network of bridges connecting buildings to each other. However, the focus shifted when the British highlighted the negative impact of Zanzibar's slave market on the world stage. They supported the Sultan of Zanzibar but also pressured him to close the market. After numerous efforts and agreements, the world's last slave market in Zanzibar was permanently shut down in 1873, marking a significant moment in history. The British grip on Zanzibar was strengthening rapidly. Moving forward to August 25, 1896, the sudden death of Zanzibar's pro-British sultan occurred. He was poisoned by his cousin, Khalid bin Bargash, who then declared himself the sultan of Zanzibar, defying the British wishes. This was because the British wanted the next sultan to be chosen according to their preference. In response to Khalid bin Bargash's conspiracy, they supported Hama bin Muhammad. Upon discovering Khalid bin Bargash's plot, they sent a warship to his palace. On the 27th of August, a significant event unfolded in Zanzibar when Sultan Khalid mustered his forces and took refuge in the palace, leading to a tense standoff. The British Navy surrounded the island with their ships, escalating the situation. By the morning of August 27, at precisely 8 o'clock, the conflict, which had been brewing, reached a climax. This led to a decisive moment where, 
before a single cannon was fired, the British Council conveyed to Sultan Khalid their readiness to negotiate an end to the hostilities, seeking a peaceful resolution. It could happen that if you comply with our supreme command and engage in a discussion for this purpose, Khalid has sent another letter insisting that Miraz and Zibar have no intention of abandoning their position, and I do not believe that the British have the courage to wage war against us. The British Council responded that they have no intention of attacking us, but this does not mean we cannot attack. At that time, outside the Grand Palace of Zanzibar, there were about 2,800 guards present, including some civilians, palace guards, and several of the Sultan's own. In a significant display of power, servants or rather slaves were tasked with the duty of presenting daily tributes to the Sultan's palace right outside the Indian Ocean. A ship, which at that time carried 32,000 pounds of goods for the Glasgow royal household, was part of an elaborate gift from Queen Victoria to the Sultan of Zanzibar in 1873. This gesture also included two steamboats from Zanzibar, further supported by the British Royal Navy. The situation escalated when, at 9 o'clock, following the Sultan's refusal to comply with an ultimatum, the British Navy's two cruiser ships, along with three gunboats and a contingent of Marines, began advancing towards the island. Remember, this was a pivotal moment. In a confrontation involving 150 warriors, Sultan's 2,800 guards stood firm but within two minutes, all three gunboats, Raccoon, Thrush, and Esperane, targeted and fired upon the palace at Koldi, where under a heavy assault, a 12-pounder cannon situated beneath the palace was destroyed. During this attack, the Sultan's royal yard at Glasgow was also demolished in a single blow. However, this took place at Kimkivo Harbor, where the water was receding, hence the water level above was decreasing, forcing Glasgow to surrender to the British flag due to the strategic plan laid out by the British, leading to Sultan Khalid bin surrendering. After arresting Bargashko, they will bring him back to India. There, a fire will break out on the lake, and Sultan, along with his fellow Arabs, will stealthily escape from the palace. The Sultan's arrival prompted an army of 500 soldiers to face heavy bombardment, resulting in their demise. The British Navy fired a total of 500 shells per 1,100 rounds from machine guns and 1,000 rounds from rifles. Despite this, no escape was possible for 37 British soldiers who were trapped inside the palace. The remaining palace guards had no choice but to surrender. Please, take a moment to process this. In an intricate operation, British Marines embarked on a mission to dismantle Sultan's flag, marking the beginning of a conflict that would indirectly turn Sultan Hamoud bin Muhammad's realm into a colony. This battle continued under his leadership, and over the next decade, 17,000 Zanzibari citizens were liberated, eradicating the slave culture from every corner of Zanzibar. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the British, by establishing control over various nations and transforming them into colonies, posed a question on whether this era of human civilization witnessed more benefits or suffered losses. Your thoughts on this matter are invited. We'll be truly grateful if you like or share our video on Facebook, and we eagerly await your valuable comments. Thank you so much, and see you in the next amazing video.